Our first speaker is Peter Alt, Senior Consultant with KTA Tater, Elsley Technology, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, NCHRP Duplex Coding Research Project 12-117. So this is going to be an update on a NCHRP research project. It's a, um, this is a standard disclaimer. All this is a work in progress. None of this has been approved by the panel. This project really started, um, or was, the, the, the research need had been floating around in, in, in the NCHRP process for a number of years. Um, in 2018, um, we did this synthesis of, of corrosion protection practices in, for bridges. And, and a couple things came out of that. So this was, that synthesis covered uncoated and coated steel bridges. I'm just going to talk about the coated part of it. And these are some of the conclusions from, from that uh, research. And the key point is that the vast majority of the states use a three-coat zinc epoxyurethane paint system on painted steel bridges. And, and there's not a lot of creativity or optimization done beyond that. Um, so one of the recommendations of the synth, or I guess technically it's not a recommendation, observations, um, was that there was room for other coding options on bridges where we can sort of basically optimize um, what we do for the environment or the life or, or, or whatever. And one of those options was this duplex coding. So as, as the synthesis came to fruition, the research needs statement got a little bit of traction um, and was, was ultimately selected in, by, by AASHTO and then funded by TRB. So that's where it came from. The, the scope of the project listed here on the screen is basically to deliver two things. There'll be an a AASHTO formatted guideline ready for adoption should AASHTO choose to adopt it or modify it, whatever. And then there will be a research report that'll, that'll go into more detail on some of the issues I'm going to talk about here today. We're nearing the end of the project. It takes a while for it to get through publication. And if I were looking at a crystal ball, I would say that um, just under a year from now, it'll be wrapped up with a bow on it and available on the internet. So let me, let me talk quickly about the literature review. Um, how many people here are coding's people? I don't want to get... So, so I'll go into a little bit of detail here. I've been in the coatings consulting and, and research business for 30-something years, and, and I was shocked that this thing that we call duplex coating is not really defined anywhere. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And this slide shows some of what it means. For the purposes of, of our project, it's a metallic coating on steel with a liquid applied coating on top of it. Now, we're, we're focused on structural steel, so that kind of takes powder coating as, as that finished coat out of the mix. The organic coating, for, for all practical purposes, is either a sealer on metallizing or it's an epoxyurethane system, so the two, fin the two coats that you would put on top of your, your zinc primer. Um, zinc primer is just being replaced with a metallic coating. And so, so the reason this is a, a, a more effective, I guess, um, um, than, than this, the regular coating system that, or the standard coating system that we use now is, is an issue of synergy. And, and so basically, your, your, I'll call it paint, your paint protects your metallic coating and then your metallic, when the paint wears away, the metallic coating protects the steel. For a few different reasons, um, there's a synergy here, so basically one plus one equals more than two. That concept, in this case, one plus one equals 2.3, has been floating around for a long time. Um, the, the, in, in Norway, they've um, really used a lot of duplex coatings, and they have some bridges that are in the 50, 60 years old, and, and it's starting to prove out that there's some data to support that, that notion. And then, and then we looked at it another way with some, some models that, that are used in the States and, and um, kind of came to the same answer, the same conclusion, you know, more durable, and, and, and we can see that, you know, 100-year life in, depending on the environment, right? That's so great, Pete. How come everybody's not using it? And there's a couple things that stop, stop people from, from using this system. It's been around for a long time. It's more expensive, so you have the life cycle cost argument to make, right? Spend more money now to save it in the future. And, and there's some kind of high profile things that, that have happened on some of these projects. Um, the biggest thing, everybody's probably seen paint peeling off a of galvanized something or another, right? And, and that can happen pretty quickly if the process isn't done right. And then, and then there's some other projects where put this fancy coating system on and black steel bolts that got a coat of paint on them and so now you got a, a, a black and white speckled bridge, right? So, so if things go wrong early on, it kind of takes the wind out of the sails of spending more money up front, right? 
that's sort of the backstory behind this project. So the idea was to, to put some material together that help folks make that argument, the life cycle cost argument, and, and don't make the, the mistakes that cause that immediate kind of failure. Um, I'll go through real quickly the, the testing elements. The, the laboratory testing part consisted of basically five studies addressed, really focused on, on, on things that should be done to minimize the probability of that early failure. Primarily means making the paint stick to the metallic coating, right? So the first study, we spent a lot of time, um, th there's a lot of concern in the specifications over how quickly you need to paint the metallic coating, right? And what that condition can be. So we did a bunch of testing trying to just characterize the surface. After we sort of got a handle on that and, and, and different ways we can, we can change that surface, um, the metallic surface that is, we looked at commonly used epoxies because that's typically the next coat in this system. And, and we basically wanted to look at several, three manufacturers and just confirm that we can use one of them to get representative results because that basically let us increase our test matrix, right? And, and, and we found that they all did perform similarly in the, the, the sort of testing that was short testing that we did there. So then study three is kind of the keystone of this whole thing. And we basically took um, four different metallic coatings, we aged it three different ways, and then we applied the, or we did uh, uh, any of nine surface preparations, and then we applied the duplex coating on top. And, and without getting into the weeds of all the machinations, the only, of all those combinations, the only problem we had was painting over zinc, uh, a galvanizing that had weathered, not been, received any surface preparation. And the galvanizing industry has known this for years, so this was not a surprise. It was actually good that it failed, right? Because that's what we expected. But all the other combinations did very well. So there's all these different surface preparations and, and, and so forth that, that, that will work. Um, and for whatever reason, the metallizing doesn't have the same problem as the galvanizing does with that, that corrosion product. You still want it to be clean, um, but it doesn't have that oxidizing, uh, that white oxidation that you see on galvanizing in, in the short term. So these are just some pictures of test panels. Um, the fourth study, so some of you might be familiar with the slip critical joints. When we go into these duplex systems, and actually any bridge repair, I see it a lot. Most of the slip resistance testing we do with a, a, say, a galvanized surface against a galvanized surface, a prime surface against a prime surface, steel against steel, right? When you, when you get into these other systems, you may end up with, um, and I'll show you a couple examples, you may end up with, say, galvanizing next to metallizing or, or a painted surface next to a galvanized surface. And that's something that's never really been addressed in the industry. It was a little bit of a, a, a side you know, divergence from the, the core of the study, um, but the panel asked us to do that and we, we generated some interesting data here. And, and it showed that for the most part, these combinations of, of, of materials can meet the, the uh, class B zip slip requirements. And then the last thing we did, this is, again, I won't get too into the weeds here, but we were kind of trying to look uh, at, the, at the mechanisms of, of how, if you think about the failure of a duplex system, you got a paint protecting, I'll just say zinc, and then you got the zinc protecting the steel. Well, when a paint, as the paint fails, the zinc is basically a barrier coating. There's nothing, there's no sacrificial thing going on until you expose steel. Once you expose steel, you get the sacrificial benefits, right? And, and so we did a whole bunch of kind of really weedsy kind of analysis of kind of what goes on at those defects and how big they have to be and all that kind of stuff. So again, all that's in the, it will be in the uh, technical report. Another part of the project was to go out and do case studies. Conveniently, we were going to do this in the middle of COVID, and let's just say that going out and looking at a bridge for fun is, was not at the top of the priority list. Um, so, so we did some virtual stuff. I did spend a week in the Northeast looking at some structures, and we had some inspectors that were working on projects, so we were able to kind of get information that way. Just a couple things I, I want to share with you. So, so these are some new structures. This is uh, sealed metallizing. And you see how it's got sort of that um, uh, Jerry Zoller from, from, this is in New Hampshire, Jerry Zoller from New Hampshire DOT calls it a industrial pewter look. But it's not paint. It's not like shiny paint that we're used to, right? Nothing wrong with it. It's, it's perfectly functional. It's just a different aesthetic than, than, than we're used to when we think about paint, right? Maybe it's as good looking as the concrete above it, right? That's, that's not uniform either. So 
This is uh, uh, fully coated in the shop, and, and you may or may not be able to see it, but the field, the splice plate here was, was field coated, and sometimes you get a little color mismatch. Um, but, but one of the real benefits in new structures, the duplex system is super cost competitive if you do it in a shop, right? So there's that. And then the other thing that we saw in Massachusetts, so this structure, everything's metalized, and they only did the duplex coating on the outside fascia beams, right? Those are where they're more aggressive environment, the aesthetic benefit, you know, and, and, and I'll show you a couple other examples. This is what, um, what, what I refer to as zone painting, right? Pick, use different coatings on your bridge to meet the, the requirement, right? Whether it's an aesthetic or performance requirement and save yourself a little bit of money, right? Another thing that, that we saw, um, a, a number of bridges in, um, in Rhode Island along the I-95 corridor, the small overpass bridges, um, and, and they used uh, duplex coating uh, along with precast uh, concrete to, to basically facilitate accelerated bridge construction where they'd go in, do the demolition, each, each, um, uh, pre, each, each uh, uh, preformed part was basically concrete and two beams, set that in place, you know, the next night they'd set the next one, do the closure pour, and, and they could do this all night work um, with minimum disruption on traffic both above and, and, and below. So that was kind of an interesting uh, use of the duplex coatings. Those of you that know Jerry Zoller from, from New Hampshire DOT, this, he'd love, love to talk about this project when it, when it was done. It's uh, uh, the uh, Memorial Bridge. It's be between Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire, and Kittery, Maine. It's a historic structure. The entire thing is metalized and sealed. Um, we looked at it after, I guess it was done in 20. 12, so it was about eight years old when we looked at it, seven years old. This is the Longfellow Bridge, another historic bridge in Boston. Um, they actually, when they rehabbed this, a bunch of the interior spandrels, they, they just removed and replaced them, and they replaced them with get painted galvanizing, right? It had to be painted to match the rest of it. Um, but they, they integrated the duplex on, on some of the parts with, with a traditional three-coat paint system on, on the uh, work that was done in the on the bridge in the field. This is the Whittier Bridge, another one in, in Massachusetts. The interesting thing here, um, so it's, it's all duplex coated, uh, except the cross bracings. And they just left the cross bracings galvanized. And the, the logic was they're relatively sheltered, so it's a less severe environment. They're small, they're easy to replace, right? And, and so it, it just made a lot of sense to, to just leave them galvanized in their mind. It, I mean, you can barely tell in this picture. I could barely, Mike had to point it out to me before I really noticed it. So again, it's another adaptation of you, you just use the coating you need for the service environment. And this is another place where that joint there would be, uh, now it would be galvanizing, touching, metallizing, thermal spray coating. Um, some older structures. My favorite one was this guy here. It, it was uh, almost 30 years old when we looked at it. It's a small, historic, uh, arch bridge in, in a kind of expensive residential area. They disassembled this, took it to the galvanizing plant, galvanized it, painted it, and brought it back and reassembled it. I mean, it, it's just insane that they did that. But, um, and, and we looked at it, and with the exception of the railings, um, right around where the de-icing salt would be, and then one little spot in the, underneath the expansion joint back here that you probably can't see in the picture, um, it was in great shape after 20 whatever years. A field metallizing project that, that we were able to get to, uh, this is in Vermont. You can do thermal spray coatings in the field. Um, pay, painting contractor did this job. Um, there's some extra certifications you got to get or you should get. Um, and a couple like lessons learned, which are probably trivia for most of you, but um, so that zinc dust that, that is generated when you do the thermal spray metallizing, and, and let me back up a step. When it, when, when, when I talk about thermal spray metallizing, it's, 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 it's kind of like a welding process. You bring two wires up, drop an arc across them, and then use air to, to, to blow the splatter the, the, the molten zinc on the surface. You get all this dust. The dust tends to float, um, and so it stays suspended a lot longer than, say, dust from abrasive blasting. And so your, your, your air ducts, your ventilation at the bottom of the thing is not really a good idea. Um, you, you need to create better airflow um, to get the zinc dust out of there. The, the other thing is that zinc dust clogs up the filters that painters usually use a lot quicker than abrasive blasting dust. So there's a couple challenges that you run into in the field. Perhaps the biggest thing is you're abrasive blasting steel, you're putting a, a 
in this case it was zinc, but you're putting a metal on it that is very similar in appearance, and then you're putting a probably a clear or, or barely tinted sealer on top of that. It's all the same color, and you're working in a dark space, and the worker's got a hood on, so it's really hard to see where they've you know, performed each step of the operation. It's another challenge they see in the field. This is my last uh, uh, slide here on, on field studies. This is a 20-year-old um, metallized and sealed bridge in, in South Dakota. And this particular bridge, the, the state had, had called us up and, and asked us to figure out what was wrong with it. And so it, it looks kind of blotchy, right? And there's a couple places where the, the metallizing was a little crumbly. Um, and basically, we think um, the blotchiness is uneven weathering of the sealer. So a sealer is usually a thousandth or two thousandths of an inch thick, right? And it's in the sun for however many years, 20, 20 years, it's going to um, um, what just chalk away from UV, right? And, and it gets this blotchy appearance. So, so we're going to be um, doing some sweep blasting and putting a traditional paint system on top of this, but retain the metallizing because it's incredibly expensive to sandblast off the metallizing, take it back to the steel, and it's unnecessary, really. Um, and this is, this is one of a couple bridges that I've come across where they went back and maintained it pretty much for aesthetics at a 20 or 30 year interval. The last few slides I have here are on the guidelines. So, so again, this is really the product of, this is the big product. And the guidelines are intended to give a, a highway engineer or a designer, um, a bridge engineer, uh, some, some guidance that they can use to, to decide if this is the appropriate system and do it right. Um, these are the sections in the, in the guideline. Again, it, it's, it's kind of all the steps that you might think about during the project design phase. We try to put a lot of tools in here. So we have a, a tables where you, you know, flow charts and, and, and cost analysis tools um, along, with, along with the text. And the last thing as an appendix to that guideline is a, is a model specification. And, and so again, this is all formatted so it could be adopted yeah, if, if, if ASHTO chose to, and we'll be presenting that hopefully at the June COBS meeting you know, for, for consideration. And my vision with this document, um, this is just Pete Alt's vision, is that we'll have a, a, a guide document that's sort of an engineering handbook or whatever you want to call it that's, that's separate. And then, and then the specification, instead of being an appendix to this, would, would eventually join this, the suite of the, the ASHTO NSBA collaboration um, paint documents. And it would be the first step, you know, there, there conceivably could be more, um, to, to provide more coding options that can be customized um, or selected, suited to the environment and, and the, the performance demands of the, of the structure. I guess we got a minute or two for one question. And of course, if you want to reach out to me, there's my contact information too. I'm, I'm happy to, to add bridges to my, uh, to my case histories at this stage. All right, thanks. Thank you, Pete. Okay. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.